Okay, so I want to talk to you guys today about a book. I want to show you a book, actually. And this book is going to be on the HMS Victory. Now, sadly, I don't really have a finished model to use as a background. So I'm going to have to use this one that I started recently. We're building the, um, the HMS Victory, the wood model ship, and we just put the keel down and we put in all the bulkheads. And um, I'm actually going to light this ship. So if you guys want to follow along in this build, um, I do a, um, a complete watch list for the, um, the build. So anyway, this one is going to be lit. And the next thing we got to do is we have to install the decks. But sadly, this is the only depiction <laughs> of the HMS Victory that I have to use as a background to show you guys the book. So the book I want to show you guys today is titled The HMS Victory Story, and this is by John Christopher. I'll be using this, among other resources, um, as we go along with the build. One of the things that's nice about the ship is that it's still around, so it's easy, easily referenced for books like this. This is John Christopher, and... You can see the back, another beautiful picture of that glorious ship. Constructed from wood from over 6,000 trees, the HMS Victory was designed as a first-rate ship, packing a formidable punch with over 100 guns arranged over three decks. Immortalized as Admiral Nelson's flagship in the Battle of Trafalgar, after bringing Nelson's body back to England, Victory sailed out on a number of expeditions until her retirement in 1812. In a wonderfully entertaining narrative and packed with full of facts, figures, color illustrations, and photographs, author John Christopher recounts the story of this cele celebrated warship right up to its restoration project and current role as the centerpiece of Portsmouth's historic docks. Author John Christopher is a lifelong transport enthusiast and a balloon pilot. He has previously written The London Bus Story and Balloons at War for the History Press. And this is a History Press publication. You can see www.thehistorypress.co.uk. And she looks pretty amazing for a ship that was retired in 1812. So, again, you can see the cover, a beautiful picture of the bow of the ship. When we open up the book, you can see it's full of stunning um, illustrations. The HMS Victory Story. And at first I thought this was kind of a, after I got it, I thought it was a children's book because of the size. But don't let the size fool you. It has a lot of information in it. And see more of the beautiful illustrations and now we go into the contents but before we do that um, let's see this book was released in 2010 let's see the contents we've got the acknowledgments the introduction building a first-rate ship the anatomy of the ship victory before Trafalgar Horatio Nelson, hero of the Nile, Nelson's Navy, life on board, a ship of war, victory at Trofelgar, aftermath, saving victory, postscript, and we have the appendix, timeline, places to visit, and glossary of terms. And you can see a beautiful picture of the ship. And we have the acknowledgments. Um, we start off with Hearts of Oak, and I, I made mental notes of what to share with you guys, so I just, I'm not going to read you the whole book. I just want to go through and show you the points of interest. The Hearts of Oak. The Heart of Oak are our ships, jolly tars and our men. We are ready, steady, boys, steady. We'll fight and we'll conquer again and again. Heart of Oak with words by David Garrick became the official march of the Royal Navy. You can see the bow um, with the bowsprit section of the ship. Bowsprit and Union flag. 
and this is Admiral Nelson, and he lived from 1758 to 1805. And look at this, I love that, it's a beautiful picture of the ship. It looks like Napoleon, let's see. Every true hero needs his larger life arch villain. Nelson had Napoleon Bonaparte, it was Napoleon. The old and the new, the HMS Victory and the HMS Dreadnought, 1905. And they give a little bit um, throughout the book, there are little tidbits, and it's called Do, Did You Know? Horatio Nelson suffered terribly from seasickness throughout his naval career. This day will be launched His Majesty's ship, the Victory, estimated the largest and finest ship ever built. Several of the Lords of the Admiralty, Commissioners of the Navy, and many persons of quality and distinction are expected to be present, for whom reception great preparations are making through the own there are uh, the town excuse me and that's the london public advertiser 7th of may 1765 talking about the launch we got another little did you know tidbit the expression letting the cat out of the bag refers to the cat o'neill uh cat o nine tails whip used as punishment when it came out of its bag it was going to be trouble for someone. You can see the illustration of the hull. The HMS Royal George, built at Woolwich Dockyard, provided the basis for Victory's design. So, Victory technically is a Royal George category ship. Well, I don't know if they do that in England like they would do in America. You can see the side view at Portsmouth's historic dockyards and that is a beautiful ship. I would love to visit her. The Atlantic Ocean separates us from her though. <laughs> you can see more illustrations. You can see her launch while building up to it. Instead of the conventional method of building wooden ships on a slipway shown here, Victory was built in a dry dock at Chatham. A piece of one of Victory's original masts, constructed from several wooden sections, now on display in the middle gun deck. And then 18th century mast maker. Victory has 768 wooden pulley blocks on the rigging, plus a further 628 for the guns. It's a lot of dead eyes right there. Another did you know? Victory was considered one of the fastest ships of her time, but even so, she could only manage a maximum of around eight or nine knots. That's the equivalent of 10 miles per hour, even with all those sails. 18th century sailmakers at work. Another pretty cool illustration. The decorative panel in the middle gun deck celebrates Victory's launch on 7th of May 1765. Another did you know there were no toilet paper in Nelson's time. A tow rag was a piece of frayed rope <laughs> which the sailors would clean themselves after visiting the head. It was then trailed in the water ready, ready for the next man. How pleasant does that sound? Something must be let to chance. Nothing is sure in the sea fight above all. Nelson before the Battle of Trafalgar. HMS Victory is a ship of contradictions. From the outside, she is a surprisingly large ship, while inside, the decks get progressively cramped. You can see a model, a cutaway model of Victory's bow section showing the top upper gun deck, um, in Oakry, the middle gun deck, lower gun deck, and the orlap. Note how the foremast passes down through the decks. It gives it stability. The cabin, although siding shutters maintain privacy when required. And this is a entrance onto the middle gun deck on the port side. 
The quarter deck looking aft towards the ship's wheel and above is the poop deck. So there are beautiful photographs throughout this ship. And again, um, the ship is still around in amazing shape, which really helps with the book. Let's see, the fork, forksail looking aft, the chimney from the galley and the ship's bell. The upper gun deck is surprisingly spacious and wore and used as a workspace. So they use it as a work for, remember there's not a lot of room on these ships. So every bit of space had multiple, multiple functions. Situated behind the ship's wheel, the captain's dining room was not quite well appointed as the Admiral's quarters. An external view of the Admiral's quarters. Beautiful. So this is the Admiral's great cabin, the rear of the upper gun deck. They would clear the furniture away when going into battle. Beautiful. 24 pounders on the middle gun deck. That will be this photo. And then the officer's wardroom at the stern of the middle gun deck also doubled up as a surgeon's operating theater. A row of 32 pounders on the port side of the lower gun deck with the gun ports closed. That's what that is. And then the main center line the main set line capstan on the lower gun deck. The capstan head is on the next deck up. The cable tier in the, on, uh, in the orlap where the long ropes for the anchors were stored. The carpenter's workshop on the forward part of the orlap deck. Pig iron and shingle ballast at the bottom of the hold. Oh, look at that shot. Each mast had a platform atop which helped to spread the standing rigging and provided a well-protected position for the mariners with their muskets. Beautiful. The Victory's three masts looking forward from uh, near the stern, on the starboard side, missing mast, main mast, and the foremast. Again, just beautiful. Admiral Augustus Keppel took victory into action in the first battle of Ushant, U.S. Library of Congress photo. In English, Jack Tar giving Monsieur a drubbing. Uh, contemporary cartoon celebrating the first battle of Ushant. The inn sign shows Admiral Keppel and the victory is in the background. Again, U.S. Library of Congress. This photograph at the second battle of Ushant, victory was flagship to Rear Admiral Richard uh, Kempenfeldt. And this is the ship's figurehead depicting the royal coat of arms. Beautiful. Another beautiful picture of the ship. Victory's uh, warpish yellow ochre and black uh, yellow ochre, excuse me, in black color scheme was implemented after the 1800 refit. And at the Battle of Saint Vincent, Admiral John Jervis had Victory as a flagship, while Commodore Horatio Nelson was in command of the HMS Captain. A relief depicted Nelson receiving the surrender of the Spanish ship San Nicolas at the Battle of St. Vincent in 1797. And Jervis congratulates Nelson after the Battle of St. Vincent. You can see that illustration right there. Another did you know? The masts currently on victory were taken from a ship called Shah in the late 1880s. 
Unlike the wooden originals, these are hollow, wrought iron masts, which are easier to maintain. Look at the, I love the little illustrations that they have throughout the book. Firstly, you must always implicitly obey orders without attempting to form any opinion on your own regarding their property. Secondly, you must consider every man your enemy who speaks ill of your king. Nelson's advice to a midshipman aboard the, Arme the uh, Agmen Agnemon in 1793. A romantic image of Horatio Nelson as Vice Admiral. And this illustration depicts Nelson leaves home to go to sea for the first time in 1771. With his mother dead by this time, Horatio bids farewell to his grandmother. And this is the battleships entering the Bay of Naples. I love that beautiful illustration. Known as the great beauty, Lady Emma Hamilton had a penchant for putting on performances of her attitudes, representations of classical figures. The Battle of, Ni of the Nile, depicted in 1798 cartoon with John Bull eating the French fleet. And this plaque on the base of Nelson's column by sculptor M.L. Watson depicts Nelson at the Battle of St. Vincent in 1797. Again, another illustration. This is 1806. Nelson's right arm is shattered by a musket ball at the Battle of Santa Cruz. Nelson became the pinup of his age. Portraits such as this were mass produced for years after his death. The often misquoted incident when Nelson put the telescope to his blind eye in the Battle of Copenhagen in 1801. Come brave, honest Jack Tar, once more will you venture? Press warrants they are out, I would have you enter take some rich Spanish prize, as we have done before, oh yes, and be cheated of them all, as we were in the last war. Jack Tar, ballad laminating, the flight of those pressed into service by the press gang. A player's cigarette card showing a typical sailor's uniform at the time of Trafalgar. And this is Portsmouth's Point Thomas, Rowlandson's cartoon of debauchery in the native town, in the naval town, excuse me. Uh, let's see. A Cruikshank cartoon of an 18th century naval captain. And this is the Bosun storeroom, the forward section of the hold. Beautiful. We got another cartoon, another cartoon, not of the press gang, but in response to the poor treatment of the naval officers in 1796. And this is around 75 Marines were based on board Victory the main tasks to enforce discipline among the crew, provide protection and to take the enemy, uh, take the battle to the enemy. Flogging was a common form of punishment and the cat of nine tails is shown here hanging beside its infamous red bag. We got another did you know near this beautiful illustration. To ascertain the speed of the boat with traveling, a rope with a wooden block at its end and knots tied it would be lowered over the side of the ship. Hence the nautical measure for speed is given as knots.
Duty is the great business of a sea officer. All private considerations must give way to it, however painful it may be. Nelson, in a letter to Francis Nisbet. So we're looking at the hammock slung above the guns in the middle deck. The gun decks were stowed away when not in use. The cast iron Brody stove is situated beside the galley in the middle of the gun deck. Must be really hot in there. This is a food preparation area inside the galley. A simple wooden plates and bowls for the crew. Their square plates gave rise to the expression a square meal. Huh, so that's where that expression comes from. We got another illustration. Contemporary illustration of semen eating at a table slung from the ceiling. And of course, it's supported by ropes to go back and forth so nothing spills as the ship rocks. Let's see, the ship's purser, as depicted by Thomas Rowlandson. And we have the berths for the sick located at the forward end of the upper gun deck to keep the risk of contagion away from the other men. The head, in other words, the toilet located near the bows on the upper gun deck. The admiral's cot, a simple wooden box suspended from the ceiling. <clears throat> broadside to broadside, our cannonballs did fly. Like hailstones, the small shot around our deck did lie. Our masts and rigging were shot away. Besides, some thousands on that day were killed and wounded in a fray on board the man of war. Sea shanty written by at the Battle of Trafalgar. The upper gun deck is equipped with 30 12 pounders. Ooh, this is a nice illustration right here. Uh, doing battle at sea involved bombarding the enemy at very close range. A postcard photograph from around 1905 showing four of the 12 Trafalgar guns which have been returned to the victory. Close up of 32 pounder cannon and a middle gun deck complete with a system of tackle, ropes, and pulleys to hold it in position. A display of the different types of shot with a cutout of the loaded breech at, top, at the top. One of Victory's leather fire buckets bearing the King's monogram. The entrance to the Grand Magazine. another illustration. The explosives were always stored below the waterline as a direct hit from the enemy could cause devastation. A demonstration of how the guns were worked in Nelson's time, probably dating from 1905, uh, centenary of the Battle of Trafalgar. Sometimes the battle was taken to the enemy with muskets and swords, Nelson is shown fighting hand-to-hand -hand against the crew of the Spanish launch. May the great God whom I worship grant to my country the benefit of Europe in general a great and glorious victory, and may no misconduct in anyone tarnish it, and may humanity after victory be the predominant feature in the British fleet. Nelson's prayer before the Battle of Trafalgar. We have another, did you know? If you are feeling groggy, it's probably because you drank too much grog, a mixture of rum and water. Well, that does make sense. Victory starboard flask, bristling with guns. The glazed windows are a, ladder, a later addition to keep the rainwater out.
Nelson's famous signal prior to the battle, England expects that every man will do his duty. 24 pound cannon in position on the middle gun deck. That's a nice illustration, look at that. Victory breaks through the enemy's line at Trafalgar, engraving by William, uh, by William Miller after Stanfield. And this depicts a typically dramatic illustration of the battle with Nelson, in full admiral's uniform. This is a very nice illustration. Artist Bernard Finnegan's gribble version of victory breaking through the line of enemy ships. And this one is a somewhat inaccurate version of the moment when Nelson slumped to the deck after being hit by a musket ball. Quarter deck, looking forward, a brass plaque marks the spot where Nelson is believed to have fallen. The spot where Nelson is thought to have died on the Orlap, Orlop deck. Hardy tends to Nelson on the quarter deck moments after the fatal shot. Illustration. We do not know whether we should mourn or rejoice. The country has gained the most splendid and decisive victory that has ever graced the naval annals of England, but it has been dearly purchased. King George III on receiving the news of Nelson's death and the great victory at Trafalgar. Now we go into the, the aftermath. A tribute to Nelson at the old naval cottage at Greenwich. And this is a drawing of the battle of Trafalgar. Another did you know? There have been six ships called HMS Victory, but none have been given that name since 1765. Vice Admiral Collingwood was Nelson's second in command at Trafalgar and took command of the British fleet following Nelson's death. Thomas Hardy, Nelson's close friend and captain of the victory at Trafalgar. More men died in the storms afterwards than died in the battle itself. Another did you know? It costs 63,176 uh, pounds to build victory in 1765. That is roughly the equivalent of building an aircraft carrier today. The King's Cutter used to carry Nelson's coffin along the Thames is now displayed at the National Museum of the Royal Navy in Portsmouth. Um, these Staffordshire pottery figures depicting the death of Nelson around 1845 is evidence of the enduring grip of Nelson's story in the public's imagination. It was another did you know? Victory could hoist a maximum of 37 sails. Wow, that's quite a bit. Another illustration, a return from the invasion of, or Napoleon at the nonplus, nonplus. This character shows a depiction, dejected Napoleon coming ashore, a callous to face, the ridicule of the fisherwoman, a French soldier with the English sailor with the British fleet in the background. Let's see, King Edward VII visits the victory and examines the spot when Nelson fell probably in 1905 to mark the century of Trafalgar. The, absurd, the absurdity of the present rig and appearance of the victory is a little short of an insult. It is incredible that she should so long have been allowed to remain in this flight, for her to preserve a vessel on purely sentimental grounds and then mutilate and disguise her in every possible way is imbecile. 
Frank Mason, The Book of British Ships in 1911. So now we're going to go into the restoration of saving the HMS Victory. In 1889, Victory was fitted with the Naval School of Tele uh, Telegraphy and continued its role until 1904. In 1905 was the centenary of the Battle of Trafalgar, not just Nelson's death. You can see the flyer. A photograph of Victory moored at Portsmouth. Note the additional superstructure on top of the deck. It looks as if someone was hanging out and washing. <laughs> hanging out the washing. Victory in number two dry dock at Portsmouth, resting on a cradle of steel. Another did you know, Victory was built with the wood from around 6,000 trees. But the ships you see on display, tree at Portsmouth, is only about 30% original. Victory at Portsmouth from the 1930s, from the shipping wonders of the world. Beautiful. Crowds of visitors descending on a dockyard at Portsmouth to see the Victory, a group of British submarines. And this is the still looking good in 2010, a close-up of one of the ship's huge anchors. Absolutely gorgeous. Another did you know, if laid in a long line, the cordage used to rig Victory would stretch approximately 26 miles. That's a lot of rigging. The Victory photographed by a tourist in 1952. Beautiful picture. And in 2010, a major restoration project was started at Portsmouth. Beautiful picture of her. And the, launched in 1860, the ironclad HMS Warrior is the only surviving member of the Queen Victoria's Black Battle Fleet. That's another beautiful ship. Another did you know... Apart from Nelson, Victory had been the flagship for 15 different admirals before the Battle of Trafalgar, and over 70 more since then. That's quite a bit. So now we go into the postscript, and you can see the timelines, and we go to the end of the book. It shows you the places to visit. So this book overall um, don't, like I said, don't let the size fool you, because it's really um, got a lot of information in this little book. And we're going to be using this as a reference because it has a lot of the photos, the way she looks today. Also, the, uh, the museum, the actual website of the ship herself. Um, there's a wealth of information there as well when it comes to ship modeling. And that's what we're going to be using for reference for our model of the HMS Victory. And again, we just started. I just got the skeleton all set. We're going to be adding the decks and we're going to be adding the lights. So my friends, if you guys were curious about this book, I hope this satisfied your curiosity. And until my next video, thank you for watching and I'll talk to you guys soon. Oh,